So now it's my turn, and I am going to talk a little bit about, you know, um, light sheet. So spin, uh, single plane illumination microscopy of, or light sheet microscopy, which is basically a, a very powerful technique that has, you know, uh, been developed in the last 10, 15 years and has been used in very, very different situations and, and very many different applications. And it's very powerful because you can do 3D imaging in a very gentle way. And, and you can take advantage of this technique for, you know, embryo studies, uh, with cells, with many other applications. And I, 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 the idea is to show you some experience that we have over the last years in developing some technology to solve particular solution. So this will be my outline. And uh, actually, when 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 we have to think about, uh, or when when I have to 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 to, to teach about uh, light chain microscopy, I always start saying that indeed it was the first fluorescent microscopy that we we had. And the reason for why is because in the in the early 900, uh, um, this person, uh, Sendestov, was uh, using this approach of illuminating from a side and looking from the top in order to pick up only the fluorescence. Because if you look at the same direction that you illuminate without dichrome mirror, it's very hard to see what is fluorescent and what is reflection of your excitation light. At the 90 degree, it's very easy to discriminate between one and another. And this was indeed in the uh, early uh, 1900, uh, the, the, the fluorescent from, from samples. The, for whatever reason, over the years, this, uh, technique was, uh, you know, for, for God. And, uh, uh, in the 2000s, uh, Han Hughes and others start to, to play around with the tool and they redeveloped this concept in which in contrary to having, you know, a single uh, uh, lens that excite and collect and pick up the fluorescent, you have two. And instead of having a Gaussian beam, you use some optics in order to generate a light sheet. So you have a, a Gaussian that is spread in space. So you have like a very flat surface of excitation. And then you pick up the fluorescent from a 90 degree orthogonal view. And you can uh, imagine that this is, is very beneficial because you can obtain so in some sort of confocality all the pixels at the same time so you gain a lot of speed so this is explaining this uh comparison between the spin and the conventional microscopy when we have either in the epifluorescent or in the raster scanning confocal you need to scan to obtain an image from this region here if you are in a confocal you illuminate all but you pick up only this region because you have the pinhole uh, in the P detection, you have basically blurred information because you you have out of focus. Well, with the light sheet, you illuminate with a with a with a sheet of light like this, and then you pick up a 90 degree. So basically, you don't have out of focus, and you are illuminating the plane that you are imaging. You you are not illuminating region of interest in your sample that you are not taking care of. It. And this is very powerful because you are only spending time in your sample with your light just when in the place where you are taking your images. Um, there are many configurations and this is not, that's not attempt at all to, to cover all of them. There are many, many, and every day there are new, but basically the most, you know, uh, used or the most known are the, the L configuration where you excite from the side and you pick up a 90 degree. Uh, you can have, you know, a double excitation. You can have double excitation, double emission. So the T, the X, you can have invert, you can have a right, you can have in any configuration this light sheet. You can combine this excitation uh, with other techniques like structural illumination, super lattice light sheet. If you are interested in, in these techniques, um, I think in the past or the past year or in the year before, we have a talk by, by uh, Gokul Padashula, who is uh, uh, an expert in super lattice light sheet, and she gave a very nice talk, so you can go there and see what you can do. You you can have light sheet of very thin uh, high, like, uh, I don't know, 
100 nanometers and the resolution in X, Y, and Z is on the 100 to 100 nanometers. So you can do super, almost super resolution on this uh, a very high speed. There are others in which instead of using a, a Gaussian beam, which has a very large conversion depending on the optic that you use, you can use a, a bezel beam, which enlarge you know, the, the beam so you can have a more flat for a longer period of, 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 of length um the the light sheet so this is a, a review that i found interesting in order to show you the different configuration of the light sheet but how the 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 the, the light sheet works well basically there are two configurations one is using as fernando mentioned for before is a cylindrical lens because if you use a cylindrical lens you will produce this sheet right at certain, at certain uh um uh, why, depending on you know how uh, basically how was the diameter of your of your uh, Gaussian beam, or you can use a Gaussian beam and basically move it across of scanning lens, and between scanning lens and tube lens, you will generate basically in your field of view a sheet of light, and if you move it fast enough and you basically coordinate the frequency of the of the of the scanner with the repetition. Or, or of the of your camera you will you will see an uniform illumination and this is basically the configuration that we use in in some of the instruments that we develop so when i joined the lfd nick hede uh, another postdoc uh, ha, had built this uh, uh, light sheet which is an, an upright l configuration for the light sheet and he was using basically this instrument to to do correlations inside cells and as you can see, well, he used a, a lens. Let me see if I can put my, yeah. He used a lens uh, with low numerical aperture, probably 10 or 20 X here and 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that in the excitation. And then a very big lens in the mission in order to have, you know, a PSF that enabled him to do fluctuations. So this was a 20 X uh, with 1.1 numerical aperture. And as, as you may notice, this has a lot of constraints on how to put your sample there, right? You need to basically rise up your dish and you need to rise up your uh, cells in order to make at the point where the two beams, excitation and collection, uh, converge. But in that, in that case, still, he was able to use uh, this to study dynamic of cells and in, in the dynamic of cells, uh, you can see, I don't know, formation and deformation of focal addition. You can sell cell division, different time scale that enable you to go from, uh, I don't know, microsecond, microsecond or uh, uh, millisecond time scale to hours or days in, in, the, in, the, in the analysis. Nick used this uh, spin particularly for this kind of purposes. So to measure basically the diffusion, to measure the uh, cross correlations, so interaction between um, uh, molecules, to use uh, uh, basically to for in vivo. And one of the big limitations that we found in this uh, configuration was exactly what is uh, in this picture. Our view of the cell was a sagittal view, right? You have the cell flat on the dish. You don't have, you no longer have basically the view from the top as we look in our microscope, either in epi or in upright or, or inverted configuration. So this limitation was a big deal because we were trying to do a new technique, basically the connectivity maps that I mentioned yesterday. And we need to manage to put the cells in the middle between these two points. We have very large volume on immersion in order to basically uh, match in the sort of fraction of all the different lenses. Uh, there was no isolation between the sample and the lens. And in some condition, this is not a big deal, but in some other it is, I don't know, if you have a drug or if you have something that can, you know, in some way uh, uh, not be nice to keep it in your lenses or whatever. Uh, you also have, you know, at some point, if you want to rise temperature, lenses are one usually to get hot or etc. So we end up thinking that we need we needed to do something else to do a new microscope in order to achieve all these things. So what we finally decided is to build a new microscope, which basically was a new illumination unit 
that has a matching in the fraction between you know excitation and emission at and it will require basically a, a chamber that has two windows in order to illuminate from the side and collect the information from the bottom. And this is the microscope and I will going to describe in, in a minute. So this is the side illumination unit that was attached to a commercial ep epifluorescent microscope. This is a, an Olympus microscope. And then we have the camera, which was a camera that we have in this, in this uh, uh, microscope. We only include here a wheel in order to change the different emission filters. And uh, this was finally a pattern that we filed together. And just to explain uh, a little bit of the configuration, the most important thing here is you can see here the scanner. So we use a scanner in order to generate this light sheet. And then we have uh, the tube lens, the scanning lens here. And you can see here excitation and the mission in the, in the, in the optics. And we managed to put together, you know, single photon excitation and two photon excitation because for some of the application that I'm going to show, uh, we require of two photon excitation. And we will see how how this look like in two photon excitation. But we need to overcome some issues. And the, the big issue was, well, first of all, we have, we need to have chambers, you know, dishes for cell culture usually has, you know, windows in the bottom, but not in the lateral. So we managed to build our own uh, uh, Petri dish with a lateral uh, a window and window in the bottom. And the challenge here is if you want to form, you know, a light sheet nearby of the glass where usually the cell set, uh, it, you will have a problem because uh, you will have a differences in the index of refraction between half top part of the light sheet and the uh, half low part of the of the light sheet, bottom part of the light sheet basically the light sheet will diverge. So basically we need the cell as a certain height. So with that case, what we managed to do is, well, we managed to find different ways on basically set our cells on top of resins, in top, on top of different matrices in order to overcome this issue. Uh, and if you have the, part, the 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 proper you know material in 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 a good matching on the index of refraction between the water you have or the medium where the cell are growing and the um, and the, the 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 resin where where the the cell are sitting well this form the light sheet and basically the tolerance that we have was more or less equal to 0.3% of difference between the indices of refraction. And basically we found these two uh, commercial resins and then we discovered that the collagen, which is very nice to use because most of cells in real life works or live on, inside the, the collagen. Uh, so we use it a lot. For the resin, basically we have to cura curate the resin using UV lamp and we basically generate uh, little uh, um, uh, squares of resin of one millimeter high, and it's very difficult to see here, but here there is uh, one of these resin. Uh, and the next challenge was, okay, but we can fit this here, but we cannot fit the light sheet. So we need to develop a new uh, chamber. This is the first attempt when Nick came to my office one day and we ran to the machine shop and I just opened a wall in the commercial um, um, commercial chamber and using Lagotita, so super glue. I, I glue the, the glass in the side, but this proof give us the chance to prove that this may work. And we take this seriously and we, we, we went to the machine shop with Sasha and Sasha helped us to, to build the first, you know, more formal chamber. And you can see this is a, an aluminum chamber that we glue in the bottom the the glass and then in the laterals. And this is a resin, one millimeter high. And then with another colleague in UCI who was an uh, expert in, in, in using this uh, uh, laser cutter. So he made all these different, you know, shape and uh, different uh, range of, uh, of the chamber so we can do fluidics and some other stuff. So basically it was a problem that early on was, was very easy to solve. And uh, here is a, is a picture, you see? So this is the station, this is the mission. The, the, the big requirement here is that this objective need to be 
uh, uh, you know, a high numerical aperture for the purpose that we want. And then it need to require, you know, a high numerical aperture uh, and then uh, a long working distance. And this is usually very expensive objective because uh, you need to travel from this one millimeter uh, uh, thick resin and then pick, you know, the high of the yourself. So, but this, this uh, objective does the work. And the interesting thing about, you know, this is that if you have, a, you know, a different sample, I don't know you want to go to a zebrafish or something else, you just switch in your turret the different objective and you keep change the objective here and you keep using the same configuration. You don't need to jump to another microscope. So this was the first proof of how the light sheet looked like and how was the resolution. So, so far it was a decent resolution, 1.7 micrometers. This was uh, the resolution in high of the conversion of the uh, uh, Gaussian beam. And then we did it uh, on top of the resin and it was more or less the same, 1.7. You can see here the light sheet forming. But then we image um, beads to prove that we were able to do, you know, 3D stack. And in this picture, you can Im immediately realize that there is a, an issue here. And the big issue here is that, you know, all this point here and all this point here are out of focus. And this is because of the divergence of the of the beam, right? This light sheet has a, a Gaussian shape in the plane. So basically, if you if you want to do, you know, larger field of view, well, you will compromise, of course, the resolution you have here. But for most of the experiment that we will, I will show you, basically, you have uh, a quite, you know, generous field of view to pick up inside the cell uh, the process that we were trying to study. Uh, an alternative to that, that was a, a work of, of Nick before I, I joined the LFD, uh, he, he, he find a way to solve his solution at the compromise of time, but basically uh, uh, increasing the resolution in the, in, the, in the length of the light sheet, in which he introduced this electrical lens in the excitation and this is the form of this is the form of a lens. So this is an electric lens that you can apply electricity and change the position of the focus. And if you coordinate this with the rolling shutter of the camera, you can move the light sheet across the field of view and you take images of little piece of the whole, you know, uh, chip of the camera. And at the end you have quite flat, you know, uh, light sheet across the whole thing. Uh, of the uh, of the field of view, um, there are other alternatives like uh, the bezel beams that also give you you know a flat light sheet for longer. But uh, well, the, I think there are depending on the application you want, you can use it or not these kind of approaches. So these are you know some of the experiments I want to show you, and these are cells that are you know moving inside on top of the resin. We discovered that these resin were not that, you know, friendly with biology because they are they were very very hydrophobic, and we start to put on top of the resin fibronectins or you know proteins uh, that are part of the extracellular, otherwise matrix. Sorry, otherwise the cell doesn't didn't like at all to live inside on, on this um, on this uh, um, material. And what we discovered that was very nice is that well. Indeed, collagen has the same in the sort of fraction of the of the medium where the cells were growing, and this is very nice because we can indeed do 3D cell culture, which is how in real life the cell lives inside the tissues. And these are two examples. I don't know if this is working video now. Now here. Okay, th this is supposed to be two two movies in which basically these are, you know, lamellar bodies inside of a, of a cell, and these were moving, you know, going here and there. And that's, this was mitochondria, and we, we were able to image in 3D very, very fast, and as, as I will show in the next slide, with this, with this uh, light sheet. Uh, oh, here, you see. The reason for why this is very interesting is because we we place this, um, let me go back so I can show you in the in the microscope. We place our chamber in some sort of adapter that we made here, which was controlled by a piezo stage. So we move in C 
the position of our sample very, very fast and uh, with a very high resolution in, in the steps. So we were, we managed to go so fast that we were able to, you know, do 3D uh, imaging of cells labeling, labeled with, I don't know, so LISO tracker and fast enough to do, you know, tracking of these lysosomes, but not one at a time, but all the lysosome of a cell at the same time, because the, basically the whole stack of a cell take to take less less than a second. So we were really, really, really fast, and this was very powerful use that we found for this uh, microscope. And then Nick, with a collaborator, Shivab, he he started to use this for for more sort of microfluidic. This was not micro at all, but basically they can see some flow, and this is 3D stacks of uh, of beads passing through the volume, and you see that you can manage to do the 3D without blurring a certain speed, more than uh, five microliter per minute. You you struggle to, to do the seat stack before the, the 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 next frame came, and basically you see like 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 the smear of the of the beep the uh, the bit passing through the volume but uh in some in some situation uh they wanted to do you know uh, uh biofilm studies uh and this was just a, a testing that they, they were able to do to see the growth of biofilm and this is basically a 3d stack of how these bacteria are growing and generating biofilms and they have some other papers about this where they treat this bacteria with i don't know biofilms with some drugs and they they can study how much this affect or not the growing of the biofilm etc so it's a very powerful technique for this kind of approach the main reason for why we wanted to do also this is because we also wanted to combine with other you know kind of uh, more meso light sheet and as i mentioned before the only requirement here was to switch in the in the in the turret of the objective from one to another and then we can go from the cell to, uh, I don't know, an embryo very quickly and easily without any further modification of the microscope. And these are 3D stack of uh, zebra, zebra fish labeled with uh, Nile Red, which is a uh, dye for labeling membrane. And you can see many structure here, like, like the muscles and, I don't know, uh, the nerves and some other part of the zebra fish, uh, the, the blood passing through. And we were so fast in order to do it, this that we can see, you know, these are, you know, individual erythrocytes. This is a 3D view of uh, microcapillar in the in the zebra fish where we can, you know, capture the uh, pass of the erythrocyte through the microcirculation with a 50 stack uh, at 0.2 second uh, of time interval in the in the whole zeta stack. So it was a quite nice uh, instrument in order to work with, with, with the animals too. But, you know, in DLFD, usually everything uh, is need to be think with, uh, with, with the spectroscopy at the side. And the, main, the big, big reason for why we built this micro was for the connectivity maps that I told you yesterday about par correlation. So we were trying to do par correlation, and this is uh, another, another uh, uh, work that I more or less show you with the, the concept with the TIRF, but the first experiment of the par correlation and all the paper that uh, shows the potential of the um, of the connectivity map was with this microscope. Uh, but the next thing that we wanted to do is the is the hyperspectral imaging and hyperspectral with camera has some difficulties. The the difficulties are that if you want to go, you know, uh, in one dimension, let's say color. So spectra, you renounce to have the space. If you want, if you want to go in space, you renounce to go in color. So the ideal situation is if you can have a snapshot in which you can have space and color at the same time, pixel by pixel in the whole camera. And uh, these are three different solutions from three different groups. And you can see here what is the declaration of the speed you have for uh, the different configuration. So basically half an image per second at uh, uh, one ten of an Im so one yes one point images per second or five or six images per second 
in a truly hyperspectral camera, which are you know quite expensive and and, and very few yeah, you know labs in the world can can have it. But at that point was more or less when when Sasha and Enrico developed this idea of the cyan cosine filters, and uh, as soon as we realized that this was a tool that we can also apply not in a rough, rough time scanning microscope, but in a camera based ca microscope. Well, we asked Sasha for some uh, filters and we placed these filters in the in the in the wheel of the of the camera and we start to play around with the light sheet. And I will show you some examples of what we did. So the concept is already, you know, uh, in, 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 in your, probably in your knowledge, because we, we went yesterday, so you can collect the spectra or do the phase transformation, but we can also collect photons through, you know, filters, which has basically this sine and cosine transmission. And this is uh, basically an acquisition of uh, many dyes using spectral and sine and cosine filter and we demonstrate that using this, the same this, the, this approach, we can re recompose exactly the same uh, data that you obtain with the with the spectral. Uh, and these are the shape of the filter that we use. So we use a sine, cosine, and then a bandpass filter to cut above or below a certain amount, ration of the spectra. And this is the correlation. And you can see for these dyes that we use, uh, this is information in the sine, cosine. This is information in the spectra. And you see that this is linear, linear in the in the G, a linear in the S, and the the linear combination properties also works. And we did this experiment with blending two dyes in order to demonstrate to the reviewer that yes, you can have different step in the linear combination. So then we play around with some examples. Usually we start with bits, and this is a 3D stack of hyperspectral information of. Uh, five different spectral species uh, of Florence F. Bean uh, at one micrometer. And you can see that the spectra are very overlapping in, with, between each other. If you, if you want to do this using, you know, bandpass filter, you will screw up. You will have, you know, bleeding one and another, but using the properties of the spectral phase, so you can split very decently. And then we did also imaging with cells in many labels, and we managed to image uh, uh, four labels uh, in 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 an five D uh, stack, so X, Y, and C, land and time. So we were, you know, happy with this. But the the, the best example that I pick to show you the, the power of this is 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 this that we we did it from from here with Andres, and we sent them the sample because we were in the pandemic and. Uh, Nick took all the images there and we did all the analysis here. So it was a very weird collaboration that pan the pandemic put on front of us. Uh, but at the end of the end, it worked out. So we use this, this, this model of zebra fish. You can study the retina because you have labels for different parts. All, okay. This is part of the retina. And the thing is, that basically, uh, depending on the, you know, which is, are these kind of cells, it will express different fluorophores. And this fluorophore can be red fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein, or cyan fluorescent protein. And uh, we thought that this was a challenge situation for, for this, this, uh, this new approach using the cyan cosine filter. And to challenge even more, we put an extra dye, which is a cytox, which is a yellow dye, to label the nucleus. So if you look at the spectra uh, of these uh, fluorophores, you have cyan fluorescent protein, you have yellow fluorescent protein, which basically overlap absolutely one on top of the other. It's almost impossible to split with a vampa filter these two, these two uh, fluorescent protein. And then on purpose, we put you know cyan, uh, the cytox uh, on top of the red fluorescent protein with the same concept. So we have two overlapping uh, set of dyes we using uh, basically um, uh, filters, bandpad filter that we have are labeled here with the you know these uh, dashed lines. It was impossible to to split the fluorescence. But well, we acquired sign cosine filter and then we transformate the data in the spectral phasor. And this spectral phasor we use then linear combination. And I can show you here. And you start to see that in some way or another you have a flavor that there are more than 
one component, there are more than two components, there are more than three components, and eventually there, there is four components. Uh, and this is a uh, you know, representation of the different layers that this uh, retina has. Uh, and we basically were happy because we, we were able to recompose the different region depending on the fluorophore that was here. But the interesting thing came when we match this idea of the connection between the uh, phasor and the image, right? And I yesterday I stressed a lot this idea of all the time you need to think that if you have any knowledge of your sample, it will help you a lot in the phasor. And if you have any knowledge in your first, or it will help you a lot finding out what is going on in your sample. And this was the case. Andres was an expert in the in the in the in the in the animal, and I was trying to put in words what is going on with the phasers. And basically, what we did is, well, Andres was able to say to tell me, okay, you know, this is the region that has particularly biological characteristic. This one, M1. And this is another M2, and this is another M3, and this is another M4, and this is another M5. So I will not give you give you the proper names, and Andres is going to kill me for that because I don't remember the names. But anyway, but if you isolate each of the region and then you look at the phasor, you remember this was the phasor region, and it was very you know broad, difficult to identify which is going on. Now you you start to see. But you have to you start to have some sense what is going on in the different regions, and what we discover is that the the, the phaser was telling us immediately what which were the molecular markers that were telling us the cells behind this tissue, right? What was the cells on this layer, on this layer, on this layer? And in the case of this one, you can see that it's a combination between. The, the the cyan and the cytox because are cells and cytox is the nucleus and then you have cyan and the red fluorescent protein because these cells express at some point some fluorescent protein and you can see here the cyan region that we selected here and the red fluorescent protein here in the next you see linear combination between the green fluorescent protein the cyan fluorescent protein and the uh, uh, the cytox because this is with the nucleus and the same for this one, the same for this one, the for this one. So basically, we use the linear combination properties of the phasor to explain which were the composition of each of the different layers and which were where the fluorescent protein is present in this in this region. And I want to point just to this uh, error here because eventually you may think that if you have many 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 pixels of uh, of one fluorophore. For whatever reason, you will hide two or three or four or ten pixels that has other information, other fluorophore. Well, with the phasor, doesn't work in that way. In that case, you see that this little cell that is here, that is labeled with 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 the magenta, are these few pixels. You see these few pixels inside the box. Well, these are pixels that has at least some red fluorescent protein and are pulling the data toward to this position. So it's, it's really, really extremely sensitive and you can see all this detail. But then we use it for, for autofluorescence and we were very happy. And this is here when we combine with the with the two photon excitation. So we did light sheet of two photon excitation. And this is the the uh, the colon of a mice. Uh, and and basically we we measure the autofluorescence and the autofluorescence basically match with the index of uh, NADH and FID, and um, basically we we were able to measure how change how much change the differentiation uh, in the cells because it's known that depending of the uh, position where in the colon you have more stem cell or more differentiated cell, and this has different uh, um, metabolism. And what I want to tell you at the end of the talk is that we don't have yet any light sheet microscope here in 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 Uruguay. Um, there are few in Latin America, but since the last year, uh, in a project uh, supported by Chan Zuckerberg, uh, is a is a coordinated project from Alain Calovi, and we have uh, here where you are, David. Here, <laughs> uh, is 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 a, a collaborator of Alain Calovi in Chile. Uh, we will basically have 
this consortium between Chile, Brazil, Uruguay, and Germany, and Hughes is the, the person that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk who reinvented the spin. He basically reinvented the spin at least twice or three times uh, since the 2000. And now he has this microscope that is called Flamingo. And it's called Flamingo because it's done in a single leg. And it's a very versatile, uh, uh, versatile, you know, microscope because you can do all this configuration. You can do L, you can do invert, you can do T, you can do X, you can do all the configuration. And the idea is also that it's portable, so you can put this microscope on top uh, of a of a cart, and you can go from the I don't know zebra fish room to the next building or something like that. You can put in a backpack and drive the car, you know, 200 miles. And this is in the plant of the of the of the of the um, of the grant indeed we we claim that in uruguay we will move this uh, light sheet to different institution in order to give a chance to the people to learn if this is a good microscope for them it's a cheap microscope to be if you build it is below fifty thousand, and it's a very powerful tool you know if you are working in this kind of uh, uses uh but our flamingo, I hope, is going to be special. And the reason for why I put, you know, colors in the plums is because, well, we will put the, the cyan cosine in the flamingo. And the idea of the spin that we already have with the with the, the side spin will be moved to the flamingo. And I hope we can do also a spectral imaging. So with that, I want to say that the spin is really an amazing tool. Uh, the side spin for me was a, a really an amazing experience. I didn't say before, but basically my two teachers of optics and microscopy were uh, Sasha and, and Nick, and I was all the time chasing them to try to learn something new. <laughs> and so far, what, what I have done here is, is because basically I, I spent many hours with them learning of how to put uh, you know things together. Uh, and, and this size beam is something that is there. At some point, we will probably try to re rebuild this here too because it's a very powerful microscope, in particular, if you want to do, you know, a correlation of, or, or these kind of things. Uh, and some of you may ask, why not film? And yes, of course, there are people who already, you know, uh, introduced film cameras in the in the light sheet. We did, uh, we never published this data, but we did put film. The only consideration is you, you need more time, uh, but it's a really powerful technique. And and I and I see that with the spectral is going to be very very powerful for here. So with that, thank you very much for every to all of you. I want to thank Nick. This is the guy, uh, and all the other people in the in the LFD, Enrico, Shivaf, and Sasha for all the help and support when we were developing this this microscope. Thank you.